The appropriately named Bird Island lies just off the southern tip of Africa. Each breeding season, 60,000 nests are established here. They're occupied by one of the world's most spectacular species of seabirds. A more accurate name for this place might be Island of Gannets. Gannets belong to the same order as pelicans, along with boobies, cormorants, darters, frigate birds and tropic birds. The one thing they have in common is that they all eat fish. With the increase in commercial fishing, it's becoming harder for many seabirds to find food. In South African waters, pressure is beginning to have an effect on the gannets and the numbers of some populations are falling. Here on Bird Island, scientists are trying to discover if fishermen and gannets can exist side by side. There are three recognised species of gannet, the Australian, the Northern and the Cape Gannet. Some experts argue that the differences are so small that they're really all the same species. Their long, thin wings are ideal for gliding and hovering. They can cover long distances to their fishing grounds at speeds of up to 80 kilometers an hour. A gannet also has the remarkable ability to fold its wings back just before it enters the water in a dive after its prey. In the Cape Gannet, the black gular, or throat stripe, is twice as long as in the other two species. It's thought to reflect heat and keep the bird cool. The webbed feet of the Cape Gannet are decorative and have a special role to play in the breeding season. Their eyesight is extremely sharp with binocular vision that can pinpoint a single small fish from 30 metres away. So similar are the three species of gannet that at first glance this colony could be in Australia or the North Atlantic. But the presence of jackass penguins confirms their location. Over 10,000 penguins nest on the island too. <laughs> At the height of the breeding season, the crowded conditions in a gannetry demand a considerable repertoire of display and signals between the birds. This bird's gesture, called a sky point, is a signal to its mate that it's ready to leave the nest. The sky point is accompanied by a call. An approaching bird overshoots its nest and has to run a gauntlet of pecking beaks before it reaches its partner. Once at the nest, a greeting ceremony takes place. Wings outstretched, their necks snake and bills clash. About 80% of gannets are faithful, if not directly to each other, then to their specific nest sites. Many gannets may even mate for life. This graceful curtsying display is designed to entice a possible mate to the nest. At this time, a whole range of gannet courtship behavior can be witnessed within a few square meters.
it's impossible to tell male from female. However, gannets are the only seabird in which the male seizes hold of the female by the neck before mating. A nesting gannet with a bare patch on the back of its neck is likely to be female. Feather preening helps cement the pair bond. As with all members of the pelican order, mating takes place on the nest. Gannets normally only lay one egg, although two have been recorded. The eggs have to be extremely strong to withstand the four kilogram weight of the parent, which covers the egg in a unique way. Gannets have no brood patches. These are bare areas on the breast of most birds where the egg receives the direct warmth of the body. They cover the egg with their large webbed feet and then lower their bodies on top. The nest itself is cone-shaped and made of accumulated guano. Adding the odd fragment while incubating is probably done more from habit than for any practical purpose. Incubation lasts about six weeks, with both parents sharing the duties. One foot is carefully placed over the eggs, and then the other placed alongside. The egg has to be frequently turned. The gannets preen continually. Between spells on the egg, the parents must go fishing to feed themselves. Flying requires feathers to be kept in good condition. They need to be oiled and waterproofed before diving. Each parent spends an average of 44 hours at the nest before being relieved by its mate. It's vital that the eggs aren't left unguarded, especially at the changeover. Kelp gulls are always waiting for an opportunity to steal an egg. No matter how careful the gannet parents are, the gulls always manage to take some eggs, often on the more vulnerable edge of the colony. Like those other long-winged seafarers, the albatrosses, gannets have some difficulty taking off from land. They need a strong headwind. Fresh gusts blow across the colony on most days. When this happens, they can take off directly from the nest. Takeoff is usually preceded by a stretch of the neck to fill the air cells beneath the skin. These act as shock absorbers when diving. On windless days, the birds have to find an open space on the edge of the colony. This involves passing neighboring gannets, which are aggressive towards them. Attempting to take off from a rough piece of ground 
may not provide the gannet with the momentum it requires. Not all trips to sea are made to catch fish. These dives are too shallow to be aimed at prey. The gannets are simply cleaning up after spending time at the nest. Sometimes fish can be caught just beyond the breakers. But more often the gannets have to fly out to a hundred kilometers to find the shoals. Commercial fishing is beginning to have an effect on the birds, even in these rich and comparatively remote waters off southern Africa. But the problem is being addressed. Alan Batchelor, a scientist with South Africa's Port Elizabeth Museum, studied the gannets, spending one week in six on the Bird Island gannetry. His study centered on the gannets' feeding habits. In order to discover what the birds have been eating, the gannets have to be caught. A crooked stick provides a harmless method of taking birds from the edge of the colony. Then they're enticed to disgorge their latest catch. <laughs> Pilchards and anchovies make up most of the gannet's catch. Both these species are much sought after by local fishermen. Over the years, there's been an increase in these fisheries on the west coast of South Africa, where gannet populations have fallen. Bachelor's research may help to suggest measures that can prevent a similar drop among the gannets of Bird Island. In the seventh week after laying, fishing becomes more and more intensive, with parties of birds constantly returning from the fishing grounds. Chicks demand fish almost from the moment of hatching. For the first week, the chick is kept warm by being covered by the adult's body feathers. After 10 days, this brooding ends, but the parents still show a remarkable degree of care for their offspring. At a week old, the nestling opens its eyes and the first white down starts to cover the dark, naked skin in which it emerged from the egg. From ten days old, the young bird can reach up to receive the partly digested fish from its parent. Growing stronger daily, it can soon thrust further into the adult's elastic gullet where it finds largely undigested fish. <laughs> a 
At a month old, the young bird can swallow full-sized fish. The parent partly digests the fish's bony heads to soften them as they lie head downwards in its stomach. Then the parent turns the fish around so that its offspring receives them head first. This ensures that the hard spines and fins fold backwards as the youngster swallows them. The whole rearing process takes just under 13 weeks. After that time, the youngster sometimes looks bigger than its parents. This is due to layers of stored fat. They're needed to sustain it during the weeks after its parents leave it and before it finds its own way to the sea. Only when the young gannets have fully grown their first juvenile plumage are they ready to prepare to leave the colony. This was the time when Alan Batchelor and his assistant marked the young birds. As well as studying their feeding habits, they wanted to find out how far the bird island gannets travel to fish in other waters outside the breeding season. The disadvantage in using leg rings is that the birds have to be captured at some future date before the number they carry can be read. Dying may not provide as much information on the bird's history as a recorded number on a ring, but it's immediately apparent if the marked bird appears a thousand kilometers away. The yellow dye is harmless and quickly weathers to a dull orange. It lasts until the bird has molted all its feathers. Using these methods, Bachelor confirmed that young gannets may migrate several thousand kilometers northwards up the coast of Africa. He also found that the adults tend to stay in waters near the colony. Some actually stay on or around Bird Island all the year. There are a number of previously marked birds in the colony. All this information helped to build a picture of how the Bird Island gannets are surviving despite natural dangers and competition from people. Once their parents have abandoned them, the young gannets spend much of their time in groups on the edge of the colony, strengthening their wings. Soon they'll join the adults as they set off for the fishing grounds. And if they're fortunate, the anchovy or pilchard shoals may be close in shore. Gannets don't fish cooperatively. If they fish as a flock, it's simply because that's where the shoals are located. It's likely that their dazzling white plumage acts as a signal that alerts all gannets within range that this is the best place for fishing. Gannets seldom go deeper than 10 meters. They usually only stay under for less than 10 seconds, swallowing their prey underwater on their way to the surface. A 
gannet hunts by searching upwind until it spots an individual target, which it sometimes loses sight of as it begins its dive. The wings are closed against the body just before the bird enters the water. It's not known whether the decrease in the Cape Gannet population is due to natural factors or whether overfishing is the cause. Seabirds everywhere are highly vulnerable, not only to overfishing, but also to pollution. Their populations and lifestyles attest to the state of the oceans that cover over 70% of the globe. The information gleaned from the study of seabirds goes far beyond ensuring the welfare of the individual species. Gannets are worth preserving, but the seas on which they depend are even more vital. Ensuring the ocean's well-being is the ultimate value of the work done by the scientists on the island of Gannets. to the breathtaking Japanese island of Hokkaido tomorrow night at the same time for volcanoes, ice flows and a rich abundance of winged wildlife.